excited today to introduce Stephen Hunter, author of 17 novels, at least 17 novels, and also known to uh, many locals here as the former film critic of the Baltimore Sun and the Washington Post. Mr. Hunter is, and in that role, Mr. Hunter is one of only three film critics to have received the Pulitzer Prize for their work in distinguished criticism. Uh, Mr. Hunter has uh, a couple of nonfiction books as well as the fiction that he's going to talk about. One of them is actually an account of the attempted assassination of Harry Truman called American Gunfight. Uh, now, uh, Steve uh, retired from regular film criticism several years ago to focus on his novels and other activities, which he's been publishing since 1980 with a book called The Master Sniper, which is actually a pretty cool story. It's, another, it's a page turner, and I think that, that if you pick up the latest, which is Dead Zero, you'll find that that's a page turner as well. So make sure you give yourself a good period of time. If you start the book, give yourself a weekend. You'll be done with it pretty quickly, but it, it just captures you. So. Uh, so one of the series that he's, uh, he's well known for is the Bob Lee Swagger series, uh, which follows the adventures and deeds of a Marine sniper from the Vietnam era named Bob Lee Swagger. This thriller series has been very successful with uh, one title uh, called Point of Impact becoming the movie Shooter. And I'm trying to remember the name of the actor who was in that, but ah, Mark Wahlberg. His latest novel, and the seventh in the title, is, is this one, Dead Zero. And, you know, it might be described as a prototypical story of heroes, cowards, innocents, and psychopaths in combat, political intrigue, and espionage with crime-solving, multiple, fast-moving, parallel storylines with plenty of surprises, heart-stopping twists and turns, and the... Uh, the usual blood, gore, and sex that you usually find in those kinds of books. But I got to tell you that the blood, sex, and gore is not gratuitous. It has a role in the story. So uh, Dead Zero is a story that's placed in the contemporary context of the war on terror in Afghanistan and the new technology that changes some elements of war uh, are, are there, but it still reinforces aspects of combat and, and the men and women who engage in combat uh, that are never changed and in their mission to get the bad guy before they get you, get you or to get, as you'll read uh, once you start this, is that there's always more than one bad guy to get. But I think the other cool thing about this book is it introduces another uh, character who I think we will, I expect to see in uh, future books by Steve, uh, the cruise missile Ray Cruz, who is also a Marine sniper. So while Mr. Hunter is not writing, he is known to enjoy shooting as a hobby and is so knowledgeable about firearms, he has expounded on gun control and the Second Amendment. And in fact, one of his uh, recently published, last, most recently published pieces in the Washington Post uh, appeared soon after the uh, Gifford shooting in, in Arizona uh, related to high capacity magazines for semi-automatic firearms. I'm sure he's gonna touch on all of these issues and he's gonna correct any lies that I just told you. Uh, uh, but I hope that he'll weave his presentation around some of the interesting and complex and sometimes flawed characters in his books. So, uh, and again, at the end of this, he'll be signing books in our book tent, and you'll be able to buy copies of his book uh, in the Barnes & Noble tent. So please join me in welcoming Steve Hunter. Besides all the things that Mike promised, I'm going to make one additional promise, and that is I'm not going to make any end-of-the-world jokes, okay? Uh, trust me on this, I don't think it's going to happen. I just have a feeling we're going to still be here tomorrow. Anyway, um, I wanted to thank you all for coming out. I wanted to thank you for showing interest in what I'm about to say. I'm also interested in what I'm about to say. I wonder what it'll be. Um, I could talk about Dead Zero. That was originally my idea, tell you how I wrote it, where the idea came from, how it got nourished and it almost died, all these facts. But the truth is, I wrote this book a, more than a year ago, and I sort of forgot it. I can't remember much about it. So I don't know if I really have anything that interesting to say about it, so I thought then, Maybe I'll tell them about a book that I just finished 
less than 12 hours ago. Last night, I wrote the last words on the draft of my new book, which is to be called Soft Target, which will be published uh, in late uh, October, I'm sorry, late December and early, uh, and for essentially a January book in next year. But the problem with that book is I also forgot it. Even though I finished it yesterday, it's kind of a hazy blur to me. The book I really want to talk to you about is the book I'm going to start in a couple of weeks, which has got me really excited. It's the best idea I've had in years and years, and it's I, for me, it's a kind of a magnum opus. I realize that I've been working on it subconsciously for years and years. I've been playing with ideas. The subconscious is a very funny thing. It's like, it's like a, a multiple game of Rubik's Cube. And it's in there, and it's turning these, these story possibilities around and trying to get them to fit into a coherent, uh, into a coherent pattern. And when that happens, it, it knocks on your consciousness and it informs you. And it sounds like to you, you experience it as God speaking to you or nature speaking to you, or some visitation, some external force. But really, it's your subconscious saying, I found ways to disguise the things that you've stolen from other writers in a way that you can put them together and probably won't be sued. So, so that's what's really going on when we, when we tell these stories. But, I, I mean, the book, if I start, I'll be here until 4 in the morning. I know you won't, but I'll still be up here. And uh, because I've got this thing worked out in really intricate detail, and it's just, it's fabulous. It's so damn good. Uh, and then the only thing I have to do, I have one last thing to do, and that's write it. So uh, maybe I'll come back next year or the year after, and we can talk about it then. So instead, I'm going to sort of uh, head off into uh, not uncharted waters, but talk about something that I think is more general and more interesting to you than how I wrote paragraph seven on page 228 of uh, Dead Zero. I'm going to talk to you about the writer and his anxiety. Believe me, this is a subject after 20 odd books I'm an expert on, and I know how long the walk is from the couch to the keyboard, and I know how fraught with fear and self-loathing and dread and self-revelation and cowardice it is. And I've tried to figure out how to deal with this. But the best thing about this subject is I begin with one of my favorite, well, not one of, but my favorite anecdote. The reason I like this story so much is because I'm the hero. And Uh, you will find out that I'm really not that much of a hero, but I'm pretty heroic, and I do enjoy telling the story. So I'm going to take you back to the staff of the Baltimore Sun in the 1970s for a decade. I was on that paper back then, and during those years, four writers, well, maybe editors, people involved in editorial and word slinging, quit the Sun, and they quit to write novels, and they very formally announced that they were leaving the paper to go off and write their novels. They were given huge celebrations. They were given sheet cakes, and they were the managing editor toasted them, and there were drinking parties for a week before and a week after, and it was a major dramatic uh, production of the interior culture of the sun. And off they went. They went, they didn't just go anywhere. They all went to special places, special writing places. One went to the village. Uh, one went to the Outer Banks of Carolina. Uh, one went to Dublin. I think one even went to Corfu, or maybe it was Paris. Or maybe it was Paris in the winter and Corfu, and I don't know. Anyway, they went to these incredibly glamorous places. And as you might expect, in the 80s, four novels were published by members of the Baltimore Sun. The joke is, staff members of the Baltimore Sun. The joke, of course, is they weren't published by any of those four. They were all published by me. <laughs> and where I went was, I didn't go to Corfu, I didn't go to France, uh, 
I didn't go anyplace glamorous. I went into the spare bedroom. Uh, I'm what you call a member of the spare bedroom theory of literature. Now, if you think about it, those four and I are really brothers under the, under the skin. We were all dealing with, with our anxieties. And what they had done was they had constructed intricate, elaborate exterior edifices that would pressure them into making that walk from the couch to the keyboard. And they didn't, what they were saying, although they didn't realize it, was that they doubted their own will to get that job done. And they needed, they needed some external structure to enforce uh, their discipline and to make them right uh, each day because they knew they had to do that and they doubted whether they could do that. So they created large dramas starring themselves in which they essentially painted themselves into a corner. They risk public humiliation and they, uh, you know, they knew they would have to spend, if they fail, they would have to spend a lifetime telling people what had happened, particularly old colleagues on the sun and, you know, oh, I got the gout, you know, that sort of thing. And they tried to use that to motivate and discipline themselves. Now, my theory was absolutely the opposite. My theory was the novelist as, I guess, spy. I envisioned myself as Kim Philby. I was the Kim Philby of the newsroom because it was a big secret. I could not, I'm a very delicate, I know I'm coming on like uh, Jack the Rhinoceros up here, but I'm really a very delicate boy. So I could not face the humiliation of failure. I could not risk. I simply didn't have the guts to do what they had to do. And in my opinion, again, just an opinion, maybe they put too much pressure on themselves. And I took extraordinary pleasure in my secret life. And I found my secret life in many ways its own, its own reward. And I found, I kind of found the culture of the traitor its own reward. I know what Kim Philby felt when he was sitting in British intelligence surrounded by people and he was thinking, you bastards think I'm just another one of the boys and I'm a Russian spy. Ha, ha, ha. And I love, I love that hostility. I mean, that hostility, hostility is very helpful in it. I just love nurturing it. I love teasing it. I love squeezing it, and somehow it kept driving me onwards. It drove me onwards through three, two unpublishable novels. And, uh, you know, people say, well, why didn't they publish your first two novels? And I say, well, you know, I lacked connections. I lacked a sponsor. I lacked a mentor. I lacked someone giving me wisdom about the business. I lacked someone who could introduce me. And also, the book sucked. <laughs> Mostly, I think it was that the book sucked. Uh, but I learned from them. I learned privately. I kind of taught myself. I would write a novel for the first six months of the year, and then I would put it away for a while, and then I'd return to it. The second one was a little bit better than the first, and I tried to get it published. And in fact, I almost did get it published another weird story. Many years later as a film critic, I'm talking to a young filmmaker who'd done a couple of very well thought of independent films named Whit Stillman. Uh, if anyone remembers him, he did uh, mostly about conservative expatriates. Uh, I can't remember the name of any of his films, but it turned out he'd been an editor at Doubleday and he tried to get them to publish one of my, that, one, that book and he couldn't, they wouldn't do it. So I'd like to say he quit Doubleday in a huff and went off and became a, became a uh, filmmaker, but he just went on with his job for another five years, and then he quit Doubleday and not in a huff. Anyway, um, um, so eventually I was able to, and, and I found also that 
that the, you know, here's a cliche, and like most cliches, it has source, it has truth to it. It's the journey, not the destination. And you've got to, I mean, I, I feel too many writers focus on where the book is going to take them, how it's going to change their life. Let me tell you, I've, I've published 20 books now, and I'm still waiting for a book to change my life. But I'm the same person exactly with the same circle of friends. I don't, I guess I've had a few classier lunches than I might have had, but I haven't slept with any movie stars, believe me that. And I haven't been to any swank cocktail parties on the North Shore or anything like that. I've just done the damn work. So from my experience, and again, I'm not telling you this is the only way to do it. Okay, I'm not saying I was right and my four colleagues were wrong. I am saying that this is what worked for me, and this was also the theory of my film criticism. I'm telling you what works for me, inviting you to interpret what I tell you and bring your own personal values and self-knowledge to it. And maybe you need that farewell ceremony and that sheet cake and the drinking party at the Calvert House. I didn't. I didn't need that. And what kept me going was I knew exactly how I was going to announce to the staff. And it was a really rancidly secret, hostile thing to do. Instead of telling anybody, once the book had been accepted and sold and was very shortly due to be published, instead of telling anybody, I told a few friends, I wrote a book review. And in the book review, at the end of it, uh, it said, you know, it, it, like the New Yorker, we thought we were the New Yorker, ha, ha, ha. Uh, we, there was, the, instead of a byline, there was a M dash and then the name and then a little identifier. And I live for that identifier that would say, Mr. Hunter is book review editor of The Sun. His first novel will be published next month. And just, you know, that was, that was my way my nasty, hostile way of, you know, I'm sorry. I, I want you to understand how base some of these motives are, and you have to harness that. If you see yourself as a noble bringer of truth, I bet you're going to fail. If you see yourself as a nasty little traitor who's going to bring down the kingdom and kick the teeth out of the king as he bleeds out in the gutter, you're going to succeed. <laughs> there may be a little hyperbole in that. Uh, but um, so anyway, I have extracted a kind of a, a theory of anxiety control that I will now share with you to how you deal with how you get yourself up off the couch. And believe me, 20 books into it, it's still a struggle me to get off the damn couch and get to the damn keyboard. And here's what, here's what I, I, I can tell you in five or six words. Uh, but of course, I have to explain the words, and we'll be here until about 11. So anyway, the first two words are, start now. Now, all the time when I do these things, I run to people who say, you know, I have a great idea for a novel. I just have to finish the research. Or, you know, I have a great idea for a novel, but I just... I'm very busy at work now, so I'm going to wait until the slower season in, in January or whatever. Or my wife, gosh darn her, she's got all these errands for me. And, you know, I can't work on the book until I get through the darn honey-do list. And, <laughs> I mean, what I'm thinking, excuse me, again, the truth is sometimes ugly. When I hear that, I'm thinking to myself, screw the honey-do list. You know, if you're going to do it, do it. You've got to do the work. You, you, and there's no excuse. I, 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 there's no excuse for not doing the work. You have to build the work into your life as habit. I always say that writing a book isn't wrestling with the devil. It's brushing your teeth. If you wrestle with the devil every day. For the first week, you're going to knock that sucker on his butt. But then you're going to lose a little bit. 
You're not going to win as triumphantly. You're going to win a little less aggressively. And sooner or later, the devil's going to beat you down. And so you're determined to beat him twice as bad the next day. And you do that. And you're feeling triumphant. And the day after that, you've decided that since you did so well the day before, you are awarded a day off. Okay? And suddenly, it's six weeks later, and you haven't worked on your book. So then you go to the book, and it feels awful. It looks terrible. It's a piece of crap. You're no good. You're nothing. Who do you think you are? And you get so depressed, another eight weeks goes by. And at that point, it's too late. You'll never get to that point with the book. So what you've got to do instead is you've got to think of writing, you've got to think of working on your book like brushing your teeth. It's not an issue of will. It's not an issue of thought. It doesn't take any mental energy. It's not something you worry about having the wherewithal to accomplish that particular day. It is dumb ritual. You get up, you flop up the stairs in your underwear, you snarl at your wife because she's angry at you because you haven't picked your socks off the floor in four years, and you sit down and you do your work. You don't think a lot about it. Another one of my, uh, well, I timed it perfectly. This is really important. So I'm going to tell you while the train goes by and you won't hear a word. No. The, the second is kind of an amplification. The second three words are kind of an amplification of the first three words. And that's, those three words are work every day. Now, obviously, I don't mean work every day. What I mean is work every day. Every day. Every day, make some kind of imaginative contact with the book. You will be stunned. You will be staggered at how much you can write, how fast, and how quickly that pile of pages or that list of files grows if you do it every day. And if you don't feel creative, too effing bad. Sit down and write some non-creative stuff. You know, you just have to make contact with it. You have to enter the imaginative world of the book every single day. Um, because, again, from long experience, what seems to me is the hardest thing and the thing that goes quickliest, quickest when you're writing a book is that contact with the book. You sort of lose connection to the culture of the book, to the characters of the book, to the setting of the book, to the pace. And you've got to reinvent all that stuff in your own mind, and that takes a great deal of energy. And the more energy it takes to sort of get yourself to that point, the less energy you have for the writing. Very much like exercise. You know, if you only exercise once every two weeks, you're not getting anything out of it. But if you hit that every day, you will be astounded at how thin and beautiful and muscular you can become in a relatively short order of time. And along those same ways, you'll be stunned at how quickly the page is now. Now, the next word, this is the last word, is the most important word. And most people don't know it. They, they don't understand it. I don't know why it's such a mysterious word to them. That word is finish. Okay, The world is full of brilliant beginners. They're far smarter than I am. They're better looking. They're wittier. They have... They, one thing, they don't have a more beautiful wife, but in all other respects, they're very fine and wonderful people. As I say, morally, intellectually, and creatively superior to me. But they're never going to get up here behind this microphone. And the reason is that somewhere along the way, they take that extra day off. And the extra day becomes an extra week, becomes an extra year, becomes a very painful regret for old age. You don't want to let that happen to you. And the only way you can, you can accomplish, you can defeat the bitterness of failure is through the simple, stupid act of finishing. 
The world rewards finishers out of all proportion to the actual effort it takes to finish something. And I mean, the luckiest thing that ever happened to me was when an editor said to me, well, do you have a book to show me? And I did, because I'd finished the damn thing. It wasn't any good, but I finished it. And because I finished it, I could present her with this pile of ugly, scrappy, scratched out pages, and she could read it to enough to understand that although it was a piece of junk, it was a piece of junk of someone who was still developing. And that if I went through it or if I tried it again, that I somehow had the professional talent. It's like baseball, you know, you could stay in the majors if you can hit 240. If you can hit 235, you can't stay in the majors. And if you watch a 240 and a 235 player, they look almost exactly the same. The difference between them is minuscule. But at the end of 20 years, the guy who hit two, uh, I forget the figures I cited, the guy who hits 240 has had a major league career, and the guy who hit 230, could only hit 235, is the hero of, you know, the Frederick Keys or whatever. You just, there's just a certain talent level. And she understood that I was just barely, I was the 240 hitter. And I understood that too. There's another story to be told about how to last in the profession. And that is understanding your limits, understanding your strengths, understanding your weaknesses, playing by their rules, even if they're absurd. Understand that they set the rules. Don't take on airs about yourself, but give them the product on time and don't go prima donna on them when they suggest changes. I mean, every writer gets changes thrown at them and 98% uh, of those changes would destroy the work. So your job as a writer is to understand which, which of the, which of the nine suggestions stink and which could really help the book. Anyway, so with that, I return you to your lives, uh, spirited and morally uplifted and much stronger. I see I give gifts to everyone. Much stronger to, to, face, uh, to face the ordeal before you. And now I will be very happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. But since I've said everything, I, there's probably not many questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. No, uh, I occasionally, I, I mean, the kind of movies that I like to write about are very rarely made anymore. Uh, they were, uh, and I just, in most movies today, correct me if I'm wrong, seem to be about Earth is invaded by machines that are 10 stories tall but look like jukeboxes, and a 17-year-old boy with really thick stand-up hair, a 21-inch waist, and an untucked plaid shirt saves the world. I think I've seen that movie about 10 times. I remember <laughs> I remember I was, I did go to see, I love the first couple of Terminator movies, but I guess it was maybe Terminator 4 Salvation. I went to see that and I watched about 10 minutes of it and I thought to myself, what the hell is this about? I have no idea what this is. So, no, I don't miss the movies. I don't miss the film criticism. I do miss the style section of that era of the post because those were very good people. I think it was one of the best, if not the best, feature sections in a newspaper in the history of the now dying newspaper business. So I'm very proud to, to have been a part of that. Yes, sir. What is my favorite movie? God, it, see, it changes. I do watch a lot of movies. Unfortunately, they were all made before 1948. So, uh, I, you know, I've, I'm actually going to go home tonight or possibly tomorrow night and watch The Wild Bunch again. 
I love that movie. Uh, I try and see it once or twice a year. I'm going to steal a quote from it as the front piece of the new book, uh, uh, the title of which forgets me, uh, Soft Target. Uh, so, uh, but, I, you know, I mean, my books, my taste in movies is like my taste in books, which is those things that remind me of myself. So I like books and movies with a lot of action that are primarily concerned with extreme behaviors on the edges of society, preferably in wilderness or war or, you know, the Cold War or something like that. I don't know a whole lot about women. I've never really had a good women <laughs> character, uh, you know. So, yes, ma'am. It's probably harder. I, you know, I honestly don't know if it is harder uh, because I'm not in that uh, situation. And when young writers come to me for advice, I run like hell. So, uh, but I will say there is a difference between the newspaper and the publishing industry. The newspapers have shrunk, and if you shrink it to a certain degree, you kill it. It is no longer what it once was. It's no longer a collection of voices and idiosyncrasies and authorities and trust. It's some sort of hideous, truncated, jazzed up dilution of that ideal, and I don't find that at all uh, I, I, I don't find that enjoyable at all, uh, or useful, frankly. Uh, but the book, the book, I still write books the same way, and you get the same book, whether or not you read it on Kindle or you know an actual physical paper object. And um, so I don't feel, I feel that only the means of distribution has changed, but the product hasn't changed. Whereas with the newspapers, the very nature of the, the product has changed. Now, maybe someone will get the idea, Hunter, I'm going to make you a star. I'm going to cut your book down to 75 pages with little pictures. What do you think of that? And we'll sell it on the Internet. Well, you know, then it's a different thing. And then I would have, you know, uh, then I would have issues. But at this point, I don't have issues with, with that. I mean, it is... It is a very, it seems to me that there's been more actual content change in newspapers than there has been in publishing. And the editors I work with are just like the editors I worked with 40 years ago, 30 years ago. I don't have any, one thing I have noticed is the production time has, has been cut by uh, three quarters. It used to be, uh, it would take, between the submission of the final draft, approved final draft, and the physical presence of the book, it was about close to two years. Now it's about four or five months. Now, I'll tell you something funny. Maybe you won't think it's funny. I think it's scary as hell. I see the covers before I've written the book. You know, it's everything. This is Steve, Steve, here's the cover of your new book. What? I haven't even written it. I don't know what it's going to be about. But see, with me, Hello, bullet hole. Here we are. <laughs> so they really can't go wrong. You know, we'll put the cartridge up here. No, let's move it down here and put the bullet hole up there. You know, that's basically, that's basically what they're doing. Uh, anything else? I think we're just, are we out of time? One more question. One more question. Yes, sir. Do you have any plans for any more uh, Earl Swagger books? Uh, Honestly, no. I, uh, honestly, I, I loved Earl, and I loved that era. I loved the 40s and the early 50s. And I've actually, I wrote a movie script uh, that everyone tells me is the worst movie script ever written uh, about Earl that I would love to offer to someone and see. But I, it's just, he just, you know, Bob is so big that he's not, it's, it's you know, it's, 
It, it's, I, I just probably won't. See, I am kind of running out of time. This, this big book that I'm, this Bob Lee Swagger book, this last Bob Lee Swagger book that I intend to write over the next year, you know, I'm kind of looking at as a as a grace note, as a, as a way of saying goodbye. I mean, I've been doing this for a long, long time. And, you know, my word dip dipstick is reading four quarts low at this point. So I have this one great good idea. And then we're going to take the, the writing out of the writing, shooting, and drinking uh, <laughs> list of Steve's to-do list. <laughs> Steve's honey-do list. Write, shoot, drink. What's wrong with that? Thank you.